Hello everyone, Alpha here, and back with some more of the Kite Runner by Ka... Wait, what's the guy's name again? I already forgot. Something Hosaini. Hosaini, Hosaini, there. Ah, uh, Khaled Hosaini. Okay, there, happy. Okay, let's go. Uh, page 9. Chapter 3, okay. So, last episode, uh, we already talked about Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. We got introduced to the two most important characters, the kid, or the narrator of the story, Amir, and his best friend, Hassan. And also, the their fathers, who both lost their wives. So yeah, they're, they're both now widows, technically. Male widows. Okay, uh, anyway, skipping to that, uh, we go on to chapter 3, which I didn't read either. So, I mean, I didn't read ahead, so yeah, I don't know what exactly is gonna happen here. So, here we go. Nor has it, my father once wrestled a black bear in Balu oh God. Bal Balushistan with his bare hands. If the story had been about anyone else, I would have been dismissed as laugh. The Afghan tennis tendency to exaggerate. Sadly, almost a national affliction. If someone bragged about that his son was a doctor, chances were the kid had once passed a biology test, biology test in high school, but no one ever doubted the veracity, veracity of any story about Baba. And if they did, well, Baba did have those three parallel scars coursing as a jagged path down his back. I have imagined Baba's wrestling match countless times even dreamed about it, and in those dreams, I can never tell Baba from the bear. Who knows, maybe his father was a bear. I mean, he could be a hairy, big Baba. It was Rahim Khan, who first referred to him as what actually became Baba's famous nickname. Uh, wh why did you give it that? Tuofanaga, to, to to or Mr. Hurricane. It was an apt enough nickname. My father was a force of nature, a towering Pashtun specimen. With a thick beard, T H I C C boys, a wayward crop of curly brown hair as unruly as a man himself, hands that look incapable of uprooting a willow tree, and a black glare that would drop, uh, that would drop the devil to his knees, begging for mercy, as Rahim Khan used to say at parties. When all six foot five of him thundered into the room, attention shifted to him like sunflowers turning to the sun. Papa was impossible to ignore, even in sleep. I used to bury cotton whisks in my ears, pull the blanket over my head, and still sound of Baba snoring so much like a growling truck engine penetrated the walls. And my room was across the hall from Baba's bedroom. How my mother ever managed to sleep in the same room as him is a mystery to me. It's on the long list of things I would have asked my mother if I had ever met her. In the late 1960s, when I was 5 or 6, Baba decided to build an orphanage. Ooh. I heard, the, I heard the story of Drew Rahim Khan, who told me Baba had drawn the blueprints himself despite the fact he had no architectural experience at all. Skeptics had urged him to stop his foolishness and hire an ar architect. Of course, Baba refused, and everyone shook their heads in dismay, in dis, in dismay at his obstinate ways. Then Baba succeeded, and everyone shook their heads in awe at his, at his triumphant ways. Baba paid for the construction of the two-story orphanage just off the main strip of Jade Maiwand, south of Kabul River, with his own money. Rahim Khan told me that uh, Baba had personally funded the entire project, paying for the engineers, electricians, plumbers, and laborers, not to mention the city officials whose mustaches needed oiling, aka bribery, blah blah blah. I took three years it took three years to build the orphanage. I was eight by then. I remember the day before the orphanage opened, Baba took me to Gargalik, a few miles north of Kabul. He asked me to fetch Hassan too, but I lied and told him Hassan had the runs. Whatever that means. I wanted Baba I wanted Baba all to myself. And then besides one time at Gargalik, I, Hassan and I were, were skimming stones and Hassan made his stone skip eight times. The most I managed was five. Oh poor little kid, he's jelly. Poor little jelly. Baba was there watching and he pr patted Hassan on the back. He even put his arm around the shoulder. Oh, yeah, now he's really jelly. We sat at the picnic table on the banks of the lake, just Baba and me, eating boiled eggs with kofta sandwiches, meatballs, and pickles wrapped in naan. The water was a deep blue and sunlight glittered on its looking glass clear surface. On Fridays, the lake was bustling with families out for a day in the sun. But it was midweek, mid and there was only Baba and me. Us and a couple of long-haired, bearded tourists, hippies, I heard them call. I heard them call. They were sitting... Uh, wait, 
They were sitting on the dock, feet dangling in the water, fishing poles in hand. I asked Baba why they grew their hair long. But Baba grunted. He didn't answer. He was preparing his speech for the next day, flipping through a havoc of hun handwritten pages, making notes here and there with a pencil. I bit into my egg and asked Baba if it was true what a boy in school had told me. And if you ate a piece of eggshell, you'll have to pee it out. Baba grunted again. Ah, I took a bite out of my sandwich. One of the yellow-haired tourists and laughed and slapped the other on the other one on the back. In the distance across the lake, a truck lumbered around the corner of the hills. Sunlight twinkled in the side view mirror. I think I have saratan, I said. Cancer. Baba lifted his head from the pages, flipping in the breeze. Told me I could get the soda myself. All I had to do was look into the was look into was look in the trunk of the car. Sorry, I was focusing on cancer. Why would you say cancer? Hey. Okay, uh, yeah. Next page. Outside the orphanage the next day, they ran out of chairs. A lot of people had to stand to watch the ceremony, the opening ceremony. It was a windy day, and I sat behind Baba on the little podium just outside the main entrance of the new building. Baba was wearing a green suit with a, and a car or a Russell hat. Midway through the speech, the wind knocked his hat off, and everyone laughed. He motioned to me to hold his hat for him. And I was glad to, because then everyone would see that he was that he was my father, my Baba. He turned back to the microphone and said he hoped the building was sturdier than his hat, and everyone laughed again. When Baba ended his speech, people stood up and cheered. They clapped for a long time. Afterward, people shook his hand. Some of them tussled my hair and look and shook my hand too. I was so proud of Baba, of us. But despite Baba's successes, people were always doubting him. They told Baba that running out business wasn't in his blood and he should study law, like his father. So Baba proved them all by not only op running his own business, but becoming one of the richest merchants in Kabul. Baba and Rahim Khan built a wildly successful carpet exporting business, two pharmacies, and a restaurant. When people scoffed that Baba would never marry well, after uh, were, were, would never marry well. Uh, after all, he was not of royal blood. He went at my mother, Sophia Akar Akrami, a highly educated woman, universally regarded as one of Kapo's most respected, beautiful, and virtuous ladies. And not only did she teach classic Farsi liter literature at the university, she was a descendant royal of a descendant of the royal family. The fact that my father playfully rubbed in the skeptic's faces by referring to her as my princess. With me as glaring exception, my father would mold the world around him to his liking. The problem, of course, was that Baba saw the world in black and white, and he got to decide what was black and what was white. You can't love a person who lives in that way without fearing him too, maybe even hating him a little. When I was in fifth grade, we had a mula who taught us about Islam. His name was Mula Fachula Khan, a short, stubby man with a face full of acne scars and a gruff voice. He lectured us about the virtues of zakat and the duty of, uh, duty of hajj. He taught us the intricacies of performing the five daily namaz prayers and made us memorize verses from the Quran and though he never translated the words for us, he did stress sometimes with the help of a stri stripped willow branch that we had to pronounce the Arabic words collectively so God would hear us better. He told us one day that Islam considered drinking a terrible sin those who drank would answer for their sin on the day of Qiyamah Judgment Day. In those days, drinking was fairly common in Kabul. No one gave you, a, no one gave you a public lashing for it. But those Afghans who did drink, in, who did drink, did so in private, out of respect. People bought their sco their scotches medicine in brown paper bags from selected pharmacies. They would leave with the bag tucked out of sight, sometimes drawing, drawing furtive, furtive, disapproving glances from those who knew about the source reputation for such contractions. We were upstairs in Baba Salih's the smoking room when I told him what Mullah Fatulia Khan had taught us in class. Baba was pouring himself a whiskey from the bar he had built in the corner of the room. He listened, nodded, took a sip from his drink. Then he lowered himself into the there sofa, put, put down his drink and propped me up on his lap. I felt as if I were sitting on a pair of tree trunks. <laughs> he, told, uh, he took a deep breath and sailed through his nose, the air hissing through his mustache for what seemed to be an eternity. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to hug him or leap from his lap and lure him, 
in mortal fear. I see you've confused what you're learning in school with actual education, said in a thick voice. But, <clears throat> but if what he said is true, then does it make you a sinner, Baba? Hmm. Baba crushed his eyes cube between his teeth. Do you want to know what your father thinks about sin? Yes? Then I'll tell you. But first, understand this, and understand it now, Amir. You'll never learn anything of value from those bearded idiots. You mean, Fula Mula Fatilia Khan? Baba, gest uh, Baba gestured with his glass. The ice clinked. I mean all of them. Piss on those. Piss on the beards of all those self-righteous monkeys. I began to giggle. The image of Baba pissing on the beard of any monkey, self-righteous or otherwise, was too much. They do nothing but thumb their prayer beads and, reci and recite a book written in a tongue they don't un even understand. He took a sip. God help us all if Afghanistan falls into their hands. But Mula Fatila Khan seems nice. I managed between bursts of tittering. So did Genghis Khan. Baba said, But enough about that. You asked about soon and I want to tell you. Are you listening? Yes, I said, from pressing my lips together. But a cordial escaped through my nose and made a snorting sound that got me giggling again. Baba's stony eyes bore into mine, and just like that, I wasn't laughing anymore. I mean to speak to you man to man. Do you think you can handle that for once? Yes, Baba Han. I muttered, marveling not only for the first time at how at how badly Baba could sting me with so few words. We'd had a fleeting good moment. It wasn't often but it wasn't often Baba talked to me, let alone on his tap, and I'd been a fool to waste of it. Good, Baba said, but his eyes wandered. Now, no matter what the Mullah teaches, there is only one sin, only one, and that is death. Every other sin is a variation of death. Do you understand that? No, Baba Han. I said, desperately wishing I did. I didn't want to disappoint him again. Baba heaved a sigh of patience. That stung too, because he was not an impatient man. I remember all the times he didn't come home until after dark. All the times I ate dinner alone, I'd ask Baba. I'd ask Ali where Baba was. He, when he was coming home, though I knew full well he was at the construction site, overlooking this, supervising that. Didn't that take patience? I already hated all the kids he was building the orphanage for. Sometimes I wish they'd all died with their parents. When you kill a man, you steal a life, Baba said. You steal his wife's right to a husband, rob his children of a father. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. When you cheat, you steal right to fairness. Do you see? I did. And Baba was six, a thief walked into my grandfather's house in the middle of the night. My grandfather, a respected judge, confronted him. But the thief stabbed him in the throat, killing him instantly and robbing Baba of a father. The townspeople caught the killer just before the noon, just before noon the next day. He turned out to be a wanderer from the Kunduz region. They hanged him from the branch of an oak tree, with still two hours to go before afternoon prayer. It was Rahim Khan, not Baba, who had told me that story. I was always learning things about Baba from other people. There's no act more wretched than stealing, Amir, Baba said. A man who takes what's not his to take be it life or a loaf of naan, I spit on such a man. And if I ever cross paths with him, God help him. Do you understand? I found the idea of Baba clobbering a thief, both exhilarating and terribly terrifying. Yes, Baba. If there's a God out there, then I would hope he has more important things to attend to than my drinking scotch or eating pork. Now, hop on. All this talk about sin has made me thirsty again. I watched him fill his glass at the bar and wondered how much time would pass before we talked again, the way we just had. Because the truth of it was, I always felt like Baba hated me a little. And why not? After all, I had killed his beloved wife, his beautiful princess, hadn't I? The least I could have done was to have the decency to have turned out like a little more like him. But I, but I hadn't turned out like him, not at all. In school, we used to play a game called Sherangi. Shirangi, or Battle of the Poems. The Farsi teacher moder moderated it and it went something like this. You recited a verse from a poem and your opponent had 60 seconds to reply with the verse that began with the same letter that ended in yours. Everyone in my class wanted to be me on their team because they, by the time I was 11, I could recite dozens of verses from 
Kayam Hafez or Rumi's famous Masa Masnawi. One time I took on the whole class and won. I told Baba about it later that night, but he just nodded, nodded, good. That's how I escaped my father's aloofness and my dead mother's books. That, that and Hassan, of course. I read everything, Rumi, ha Hafez, Sadi, Becker, blah blah blah, me, Ian Fleming. When I had finished my mother's books, not, not the boring history ones, I was never much into those, but the novels, the epics, I started spending my allowance on books. I bought, the one, I bought one a week from the bookstore near Cinema Park and stored them in cardboard boxes when I ran out of shelf room. Of course, marrying a poet, marrying a poet was one thing, but fathering a son who preferred burying his face in poetry books to hunting, well, that wasn't how Baba had envisioned it. I suppose real men didn't read po poetry, and God forbid they should ever write it. Real men, real boys, played soccer just as Baba had when he had been young. Now that was something to be passionate about. In 1970, Baba took a break from the construction of the orphanage and flew to Tehran for a month to watch the World Cup games on televisions. Since at the time, Afghanistan didn't have TV sets. He signed me up for soccer teams to steer the same passion in me, but I was pathetic. A blundering liability to my own team, always in the way of an opportunate pass or unwit unwittingly blocking an open lane. I shambled about the field on scraggy legs, quelled for passes that never came my way. And the harder I tried, waving my arms over my head frantically and screeching, I'm open, I'm open! The more I went ignored, but Baba wouldn't give up. When it, came, uh, become, when it became abundantly, 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 ah crap I can't read, Ab abundantly clear that I hadn't inherited a shred of his athletic talents, he settled for trying to turn me into a passionate spectator. Certainly I could manage that, couldn't I? I vacant the rest for as long as possible, I cheered with him when Kabul's team scored against Kandahar and yup and saw to the referee when he called a penalty against our team. But Baba sensed my lack of genuine interest and resigned himself to bleak fact that his son was never going to either play or watch soccer. Ooh, shunned. I remember one time Baba took me to the yearly Bujaski tournament. That took place on the first day of spring, New Year's Day. Bujaski was and still is Afghanistan's national pa passion. A champandas, a, a highly skilled horseman. Usually patronized by rich African aficionados, has to snatch a gold or cattle carcass from the midst of a melee, carrying that carcass with him around the stadium at full gallop, and drop it in a scoring lyrical with a, while a team of other chapandes chases him and does anything in his power to claw, whip, punch, to snatch the carcass from him. That day the crowd roared with excitement as the horsemen on the field bellowed, bellowed their bell cries and jostled over, uh, jostled over for the carcass in a cloud of dust. There trembled with the clatter of hooves. We watched from the upper bleachers as riders pounded past us at full gallop, yipping and yelling, foam flying from their horses' mouths. At one point Baba pointed to someone, Amir, do you see that man sitting Amir, do you see that man sitting up there with those other men around him? I did. That's, Hen That's Henry Kissinger. Oh, I said. I don't know who Henry Kissinger was, and I might have asked, but at the moment, I watched with horror as one of the Chapandas fell off his saddle and was trampled under a score of hooves. His body was tossed and hurled into a stampede like a rag doll, finally rolling to, to a stop when the melee moved on. He twitched once and lay motionless, his legs bent at unnatural angles, a pool of his blood soaking through the sand. I began to cry. I cried all the way back home, I remember how Baba's hands clenched around the steering wheel, clench and unclench. Mostly I will never forget Baba's valiant efforts to conceal the disgusted look on his face as he drove in silence. Later that night, I was passing by my father's study. When I overheard him speaking to Haram Khan, I pressed my ear to closely to the door. Grateful that he's healthy, Rahim Khan was saying. I know, I know, but he's always buried on those books or shuffling around the house like he's lost in some dream. And? I wasn't like that, Baba sounded frustrated, almost angry. Rahim Khan laughed. Children, are, children aren't calling books. You don't get to fill them with your favorite colors. I'm telling you, Baba said. I wasn't like that at all and neither were any of the kids I grew up with. 
You know, sometimes you are the most self-centered man I know, Raymond Khan said. He was the only person I knew who could get away with saying something like that. It has nothing to do with that. Nay? Eh? Nay. Eh. Then what? I heard the leather of Baba's feet cracking as he shifted on it. I closed my eyes, pressed my ear even harder against the door, wanting to hear, not wanting to hear. Sometimes I look out this window and I see him playing on the street with the neighborhood boys. I see how they push him around, take his toys from him, give him a shove here, a whack there, and you know, he never fights back. Never. He just drops his head and... So he's not violent, Rain Khan said. That's not what I meant. Rahim, and you know it, Baba shot back. There's something missing in that boy. Yes, a mean streak. Self-defense has nothing to do with meanness. You know what always happens when the neighborhood boys tease them. Hassan steps in and fends them off. I've seen it with my own eyes. And when they, came, when they come home, I say to him, How did Hassan get that scrape on his face? And he says, He fell down. I'm telling you, Rahim. There's something missing in that boy. You, you just need to lay it, let him find his own way, Remy Khan said. And where is he headed? A boy who couldn't, a boy who wouldn't stand up for himself because becomes a man who can't stand up, who can't stand up for anything. As usual, you're oversimplifying. I don't think so. You're angry because you're afraid he'll never take over the business for you. Now who's oversimplifying? Look, I know there's a fondness between you and him, and I'm happy about it. Envious, but happy. I mean that. He needs someone who understands him. Because God knows, I don't. But something about Amir troubles me in a way that I can't express. It's like... I could see him searching, reaching for the right words. He lowered his voice, but I heard him anyway. If I hadn't seen the doctor pull him out of my wife with my own eyes, I'd never believe he's my son. The next morning, as he was preparing my breakfast, the son asked if something was bothering me. I snapped at him, told him to mind his own business. Rahim Khan had been wrong about the mean street thing. And there we go, chapter 3. So here we learn about um, his relationship with his father. It's not very good. Uh, his father thinks he's weak. He, uh, yeah, he thinks he's weak because he's not interested in sports. He's not like the, the, the stereotypical meaning of manliness. Yeah, he's more of a bookworm. Yeah. But that's actually because of his father's fault that his father wouldn't communicate with him. So he actually spent more time with Hassan and reading himself with books. So yeah, technically his father's fault as well. So I guess we'll end this one here and chapter 4 will be on the next one. Goodbye guys.